Yo, 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 what's up? Time for a slide on the graph data structure. An abstract data type, ADT, that solves routing problems. A computer science implementation from mathematics graph theory. Similar to the tree structure with important differences. Comes in undirected and directed version. Comes in unweighted and weighted versions. This example right here is an undirected, unweighted. Other types will be covered as we progress. The graph data structure, an abstract data type, or ADT, that solves routing problems. Graphs are so related to trees, it's not even funny. In fact, a tree is a certain type of graph. A graph can have a cycle. Start in A, go to B, then to C, and back to A. This is a cycle in the graph, A, B, C, back to A. We've got the same cycle with A, C, E, back to A. Trees do not have cycles. Graphs do. Trees are hierarchical. Trees have a top, the root. Trees have a bottom, the leaves. Graphs do not have a top and bottom. A tree is a graph without a cycle. Trees are a subset of graphs. Graph data structure. Choose a hash table for fast access to data. Choose a tree for sorted access to the data. Choose a graph for solving a routing problem. What really defines a graph is the types of problems they help to solve. Routing problems. Anytime people Vehicles, information needs to move from point A to point B, passing through several points. A graph can be used to solve the problem. With other data structures, it was primarily about storing data. With a graph data structure, it is about storing data and solving a routing problem. And solving the routing problem may be more important. It's important to learn the terms when it comes to the graph data structure. A vertex, data is stored in a vertex. Each circle in this graph represents a vertex. There's a vertex, there's a vertex. It's equivalent to a node in a tree. Label identifies the vertex. C is the label for a specific vertex in the graph. Vertices is plural for vertex. A is a vertex. A, B, C, D, and E are vertices. Edge, connection between two vertices. C, E is an edge between vertex C and vertex E. This is the edge between C and E. More terms. Adjacent, two vertices are adjacent if there is one and only one edge between them. B and C are adjacent because there's one and only one edge between them. B and D are not adjacent. Path, sequence of edges from one vertex to another. D, A, C is a path from D to C. But so is D, A, E, and C. Connected is when you can reach every vertex from every other vertex. This is a connected graph. From A, you can reach everywhere else in the graph. And that's true for everywhere. From E, you can reach every vertex. Non-connected is when you cannot reach a vertex from some other vertex. Find any two vertices X and Y with no path. That's a non-connected graph. If you remove the edge between D and A, this would be a non-connected graph. D, if you lose this connection right here, D would be disconnected from the graph. It would be a non-connected graph. More terms. Directed. When an edge must be traveled in a certain direction, like a one-way street, an arrow is used for direction. If B and C can only be traveled from B to C, see that arrow right there? That is a directed graph. Undirected graph. Edges are two-way streets. From E to C and C to E is implied by no arrow on this edge. 
This means, without arrows, that you can travel from E to C as easily as you can travel from C to E. Weighted, when there is a cost or toll to travel an edge, usually listed next to the edge, like this example. This could be 10, as in $10, or 10 minutes, or 10% available bandwidth. Cost is not always a money value. The weight is not always money. Unweighted, no cost or toll to travel an edge. Lack of a value next to the edge indicates unweighted. We will start with undirected and unweighted graphs and move on to directed and weighted graphs later on in these lessons. Routing problems. The classic routing problem is airline passengers. The vertices on the graph represent airports and the edges are round trip flights. The flight between A and C is canceled. How do we route passengers to A, B, and C, or A, E, and C to make up for the canceled flight? What if airport E closes for snow? How do we reroute passengers that would have stopped in E while heading to A or C? Not everyone that passes through airport E is planning to go to E. They may be just stopping on their way to C or stopping on their way to A. What time do flights from D to A need to arrive to make connections to B, C, and E? This is a flight from airport D to airport A. You need to make your connections to the other airports in the network. Load balancing. This is big, big, big money. If too many book flights from A to B to C and those flights sell out, we can no longer sell direct flights from A to B or direct flights from B to C. What we want to do is encourage passengers to book different routes. So let's raise the price if you're intending to go from A to B to C and let's lower the prices from A to E to C and more people will book the flights on this lower route. That means the flights from A to B and B to C do not sell out and we can still sell tickets on that route. Routing problems. Trucking and shipping. Let's say the vertices on the graph represent seaports and the edges are shipping lanes. Or it could be UPS or FedEx terminals and trucks. Moving cargo is big business. There are different deadlines, next day, two day or five day arrival. Fruits and vegetables need refrigerated ships or trucks. Drivers need rest periods. There's weight limits versus fuel economy. Many factors must be weighed, pun intended. Load balancing is big, big, big money. It seems like every graph problem comes down to load balancing. The company that moves cargo on full trucks makes more money than the one that spends the same salary and fuel costs to move half-empty trucks. More routing problems. Your car or phone GPS. The vertices on the graph here represent freeway or highway interchanges and the edges are the roads between them. Driving from B to C, there are several options. Which route does the GPS choose based on time, toll roads, and distance? Drivers again need rest periods. There's weight limits versus fuel economy. There's many factors that must be weighed. If I'm GPS software and I'm trying to guide someone from A to C, you can see there are multiple routes to take. How do I determine which route I should travel to get to C? Game design uses more real world type problems. Grand Theft Auto style games have players driving through cities. Sim style games have players moving goods and people in the virtual world. War games require players to move tanks, ammo, and supplies. Routing data or routing goods often a subplot in video games. Routing algorithms help us to code that type of game. One more routing problem, computer networks. The vertices on the graph are routers and the edges are communication links between them. Massive online games like Pokemon Go are a computer networking problem. Multiplayer shooter games played over a network require commands from players all over the world to be routed and processed in real time to make it fair for all players, regardless of the connection speed or distance from the server. 
When it comes to game programming, especially online games, it's not just the visual interface you see on the screen. There is a huge back-end or server-side code needed to support the game and or manage traffic and it involves solving routing problems. Adjacency list. Graph algorithms need a way to tell which vertices are connected or adjacent. First up, each vertex keeps a list of vertices that are directly connected. When an algorithm is looking at vertex A, a link list tells it the other vertices that can be reached with a single edge. Since A is adjacent to every vertex, you can see it has a lengthy list. The numbers on the edges and above the list highlight which edges match the vertex. A is connected to B and C and D and E. The edge that connects A and B is right there. The edge that connects A and C is right there. 3 is the edge that connects D and A. And finally, 4 is the edge that connects A and B. Adjacency list. When an algorithm is looking at vertex B, a link list tells it the other vertices that can be reached with a single edge. Since B has two adjacent vertices, it has two items in its list. Since D has one adjacent vertex, only one item in its list. The numbers 1, 2, 3 are not part of the graph in any way. They are just listed to show you why a vertex is in the list. If you look closely at B, it has an edge from B to A, and it has an edge from B to C. So B's linked list contains A and C. If you look at D, that edge right there, number three, is the edge between D and A. A is the only vertex you can reach from D. Adjacency list. When an algorithm is looking at vertex C, a link list tells it the other vertices that can be reached with a single edge. Since C has three adjacent vertices, it has three items in its list. Since E has two adjacent vertices, two items in its list. The numbers 1, 2, 3, and 4 are not part of the graph in any way. They are just listed to show you why a vertex is on the list. Who's connected to C? There's an edge to A, an edge to B, and an edge to E. Who's connected to E? E has an edge to A, and E has an edge to C. Adjacency matrix. Graph algorithms need a way to tell which vertices are connected or adjacent. The second option is to keep a single matrix or table to track edges. When an algorithm is looking at vertex A, a matrix tells it the other vertices that can be reached with a single edge. The ones in the row A indicate which vertices A is connected or adjacent to. The ones on the edges and superscripted on the row show which edges match each one. This one here says the edge between A and B. The 2 shows you the edge between A and C. The 3 shows you the edge between A and D. And finally, the 4 indicates which edge is between A and E. Adjacency matrix. When an algorithm is looking at vertex B, a row in the matrix tells it the other vertices that can be reached with a single edge. Since B has two adjacent vertices, it has two ones in its row. Since D has one adjacent vertex, there is a single one in its row. The smaller one, two, three are not part of the graph or matrix in any way. They're listed to show you why a big one is in that row. This one indicates there's an edge between B and A. This one indicates there's an edge between B and C. There's the edge between A and B. There's the edge between B and C. Looking at vertex D's row in the table, you can see there's a single one, which means there's a single edge between D and A. Adjacency matrix. When an algorithm is looking at vertex C, a row in the matrix tells it the other vertices that can be reached with a single edge. 
Since C has three direct adjacent vertices, it has three ones in its row. Since E has two adjacent vertices, two ones in E's row. The smaller 1, 2, 3, 4 are not part of the graph or matrix in any way. They are listed to show you why a big one is in that row. This one indicates there is an edge between C and A, and there it is. This one indicates there's an edge between C and B. There it is. And this one indicates there's an edge between A and E. And sure enough, there it is. It is not set in stone the adjacency matrix must use 0 and 1 to indicate edges. It simply means the matrix was declared as a 2D array of int data type. If the matrix was declared as a 2D array of a Boolean data type, true or t false or f would indicate an edge or no edge the adjacency list is an alternative to the adjacency matrix only one is needed it would be redundant to use both on the same graph depth first search dfs search for an item or path in the graph using a stack Think of depth first search like a bungee jump. You leap from point A and get as far away from point A as the rope will stretch. When you can go no further, the rope pulls you back along the path you came until you reach a point where gravity makes you head back in the other direction. You repeat this up and down until you stop bouncing and are pulled back to point A. On the bungee, you make the jump and you stretch it as far as you can. You snap back up. You stretch it back down, you snap back up. You stretch it back down, you snap back up. When doing a depth first search, you spring out as far as you can, then snap back and spring out again. Depth first works the same way. Stretch out as far as it can go, snap back, then stretch out, snap back, repeat until the search is complete. Start in A, stretch out as far as you can, come back to A, and then go back out. Depth First Search, DFS. Search for an item or path in the graph using a stack. A common example of a graph operation is searching the graph. Finding all vertices that can be reached from any vertex in the graph, looking or searching for some data stored in the graph, or to find a path from one location in the graph to another. Regardless of the motivation, both require finding all the vertices that can be reached from a given point in the graph. The two rules to do a depth first search. Number one, visit one adjacent unvisited vertex, mark it as visited, and push it on the stack. Step one is a loop. We repeat this step over and over and again. When you can no longer do step one, fall down to step two. Pop a vertex off the stack and try rule number one again. When the stack is empty, the search is done. Start the depth first search at vertex A. The red arrow is the vertex we are currently visiting. That's this red arrow right there. The word visit in the node indicates that A has been searched. Do not return. Once A has been visited, we don't need to take a path back to A. Vertex A has been pushed onto the stack. We see A is pushed onto the stack here. Rule number one is a loop. Repeat it until it can't be done anymore. We're going to keep repeating rule one over and over again. Move from vertex A to adjacent vertex B. The red arrow is the vertex we are currently visiting B. We've gone from A to B now. The word visit in the node indicates B has been searched. Do not return. Avoid cycles in the graph. Vertex B has been pushed onto the stack. Rule number one is a loop. Keep repeating rule number one over and over again until it cannot be done anymore. Move from vertex B to adjacent vertex E. The red arrow is the vertex we are currently visiting. We've moved from B to E. The word visit in the node indicates E has been searched. Do not return to E in a cycle. Vertex E has been pushed onto the stack. Rule number one is a loop. Keep repeating it until it cannot be done anymore. It almost looks like we're at the end of the rope here, but not quite. Move from vertex E to adjacent vertex C. 
C is an adjacent vertex to E. As long as we can stretch out, we'll keep going. The red arrow is the vertex we are currently visiting C. The word visit in the node indicates C has been searched. Do not return. Avoid cycles in the graph. Vertex C has been pushed onto the stack. Rule number one is a loop. We'll keep repeating it until it cannot be done anymore. Let's pause our depth for search. We do not return to visited vertex. We're going to stop our stretch out here. Notice how A is marked visited. We will not take the edge from C to A. We do not wish to return to a vertex we've already been to. Vertex C does have an adjacent vertex A, but it is marked visit, do not return. Must avoid searching in a circle or cycle. We have reached the end of the bungee cord, vertex C. We cannot do rule number one anymore. Only now do we drop down to do rule number two. Vertex C is popped off the stack and we return to vertex E. At this point, go back to rule number one and check E for adjacent unvisited vertexes. Vertex E looks for an adjacent unvisited vertex, but B and C are clearly marked as visit Rule number one fails. Time to drop down to do rule number two. Let's play what if. What if there was an edge from E to F? Would it have taken it? Absolutely yes. Vertex E is popped off the stack and the return to vertex B occurs. We took E off the stack and went back to B, the top of the stack. Check at this point at this point, check B for an adjacent unvisited vertex. Do rule number one. Vertex B looks for an adjacent unvisited vertex, but A and E are clearly marked with a visit. Rule number one fails. It's time to drop down to rule number two. Let's play what if. If there was an edge from B to C, would you have taken it? Absolutely not. You would not have taken an edge from B to C because we've already been to C. Vertex B is popped off the stack and we return to A. At this point, check A for an adjacent unvisited vertex, rule number one. This return to rule number one is going to be different. Why? It's going to be different because there is an adjacent unvisited vertex. Move from vertex A to adjacent vertex D. The red arrow is the vertex we are currently visiting D. We're going to go from A to D. The word visit in the node indicates D has been searched. Do not return or take a cycle back to D. Once you've been to D one time, you don't need to come back. Vertex D has been pushed onto the stack. After the bungee cord snap back to A, it's time to move back away from A again. We went out as far as we could, we snapped back to A, and now we're going out again. Rule number one is a loop. Let's repeat it until it cannot be done anymore. Move from vertex D to adjacent vertex F. The red arrow is the vertex we are currently visiting, F. The word visit in the node indicates F has been searched. Do not return to F. Do not come back through a cycle to vertex F. Vertex F has been pushed on top of the stack. Rule number one is a loop. Repeat it until it can't be done anymore. Vertex F clearly has no adjacent unvisited vertices. F is done. Rule number one has failed. It's now time to drop down to rule number two. Vertex F is popped off the stack and we return to vertex D. At this point, check D for adjacent unvisited vertex. Check rule number one. Vertex D looks for an adjacent unvisited vertex, but A and F are clearly marked as visited. When I go back to D, F has a visit, A has a visit, there's nowhere to go. Rule number one fails, it's time to drop down to rule number two. Vertex D is popped off the stack and we return to vertex A. Vertex D is popped off the stack and return to vertex A occurs. At this point, check A for an adjacent unvisited vertex. Do rule number one. 
on A. Vertex A looks for an adjacent unvisited vertex, but B, C, and D are clearly marked as visit. Rule number one fails, time to drop down to rule number two. Do you see the bungee jump analogy? From A, it went out to C. It snapped back to A, where it went back out to F. It snapped back to A. It checks to go out again, but rule number one fails. We started at A, and we went out as far as we could. We snapped back to A. We went out again. We snapped back to A. If there's nowhere else to go, then we'll stop at A. Vertex A is popped off the stack. At this point, the stack is empty and the search is complete. You can see that all vertices have been visited. If searching for an item, every vertex would have been looked at. If looking for a path, ABEC and ADF were the two paths that the search followed. Minimum spanning tree. If you look closely at the two paths, the algorithm followed. A to B to E to C and A to D to F. These form a minimum set of edges to fully connect the graph. The only edge not taken was from C to A. I temporarily block this out because we never use this edge to search the graph. It is not in the minimum spanning tree or MST. The MST is important when looking to remove redundant edges or remove cycles from the graph. A graph without a cycle is a tree. This is what we call the minimum spanning tree. We have removed the cycles from the graph, yet we still may visit every vertex in the graph. Breath first search, BFS. Search for an item or path in the graph using a queue. Think of breath first search like a spider web. It reaches in many different directions to everything close to it. Once it reaches everything close by, it uses the queue, first in, first out, to then do the same search from the first, notice the F, vertex it reached. BFS works the same. Start close to the origin and go everywhere close. Then expand the search further out in stages until the search is complete. Look at the spider web. It starts at a point and it kind of goes to everybody that's close by. Once it's built that segment and then it goes farther out. Once that segment is built, then it goes farther out. And it gradually increases its distance from the origin. Same thing for a breath first search. We're going to start at A and go everywhere that's close by. When we're done going everywhere close by, then we'll extend our search farther out. Breath first search, BFS. Search for an item or path in the graph using a queue. A common example of a graph operation is searching the graph. Find all vertices that can be reached from any vertex in the graph, looking or searching for some data stored in the graph, or to find a path from one location in the graph to another. Regardless of the motivation, both require finding all vertices that can be reached from a given point in the graph. Two big differences between a breadth first search and a depth first search. Number one, use a queue for the breadth first search. And number two, stay home. Do not leave a vertex until it is done. Start the breadth first search at vertex A. The red arrow is the vertex where we are currently visiting. We are currently in vertex A. The word visit in the vertex indicates A has been searched, do not return, avoid cycles. Vertex A is going to stay home. Stay in A and visit every adjacent vertex. Remember on depth first search, we jumped to B, we jumped to E as fast as we could. With this algorithm, we are going to stay in A. Rule number one is a loop, repeat it until it can't be done anymore. The two rules for a depth first search. First, visit one adjacent unvisited vertex, mark it as visited, and insert into the queue. But this time, stay home. We're going to loop through this step, but we're going to stay in A until we're done with it. Move from A to adjacent vertex B. 
The red arrow is the vertex we are currently visiting B. The word visit in the vertex indicates B has been searched. Do not return to B, avoid cycles. So we went from A to visit B. Vertex B has been inserted into our queue. This is the front of our queue. There's the back of our queue. Rule number one is a loop. Repeat until it can't be done anymore. Here is the big difference with a breadth first search. Stay in A. On a depth first search, we would have stayed in B and gone out from B. And a breadth first search, we stay at A and visit everybody that's adjacent to A. Staying home in A, move from vertex A to adjacent vertex C. The red arrow is the vertex we are currently visiting C. The word visit in the vertex indicates C has been searched. Do not return to C using a cycle. Vertex C has been inserted into the queue. You can see it at the end of the queue. And rule number one is a loop. Repeat rule number one over and over until it can't be done anymore. Note how A stays home. We are not leaving vertex A. Move from vertex A to adjacent vertex D. The red arrow is the vertex we are currently visiting D. We go from A to D and mark D is visited. The word visit in the vertex indicates D has been searched. Do not return to D in a cycle. Vertex D has also been inserted into the queue. Rule number one is a loop. Repeat it until it can't be done anymore. Pause the breath first search. Vertex A does not have another adjacent vertex. Rule number one has failed. A is now done. Only now do we drop down to rule number two. Please look at the front of the queue. Look at A. We've been everywhere that A is attached to. A is done. We're going to fall down and do step two of the procedure. Look closely at who's at the front of the queue. B. Vertex B is removed from the queue and the current vertex is now B. At this point, go back to rule number one and check B for all adjacent unvisited vertices. BFS, breath first search, says once B is current, we must visit all adjacent unvisited vertices of B. Move from vertex B to adjacent vertex E. The red arrow is the vertex we are currently visiting E. The word visit in the vertex indicates E has been searched. Do not return. Avoid cycles. Look at rule one. Visit one adjacent unvisited vertex. We did that. B went to E. Mark it as visited. There's the mark of visited. And then insert E into the queue. There's the third part of it. Insert E into the queue. Rule number one is a loop. Repeat until it can't be done anymore. Pause the breath first search. Vertex B does not have another adjacent vertex. Rule number one has failed. B is now done. Only now do we drop down and do rule number two. Please look at the front of the queue. If you look closely at B, we've been to A, we've been to E. There's nobody else attached to B to visit. We are going to leave rule number one and fall down to rule number two. If you can't do rule number one, remove a vertex from the queue and try rule number one again. When the queue is empty, the search is done. Vertex C is removed from the queue and the current vertex is now C. At this point, go back to rule number one and check C for all adjacent unvisited vertices. BFS says once C is current, we must visit all adjacent unvisited vertices of C. C is our current vertex. But pause BFS. When we get back to C, there's nobody attached to C that we have not been to already. Vertex C does not have another adjacent vertex. Rule number one has failed. C is now done. Only now do we drop down to rule number two. Please, once again, look at the front of the queue. Who's at the front of the queue right now? Vertex D. Vertex D is removed from the queue and the current vertex is now D. Look at that arrow right there. We are now in vertex D. At this point, go back to rule number one and check D for all adjacent unvisited vertices. 
BFS says once D is current, we must visit all adjacent unvisited vertices of D. Back in rule one, move from vertex D to adjacent vertex F. The red arrow right there is the vertex we are currently visiting F. The word visit in the vertex indicates F has been searched. Do not return to F. Do not take a cycle back to F. Vertex F has been inserted into the queue. We've now done all three parts of rule number one. We did a visit of one adjacent unvisited vertex. We marked it as visited and we inserted it into the queue. Rule number one is a loop. Repeat it until it cannot be done anymore. Pause the breath first search. Vertex D does not have another adjacent unvisited vertex. Rule number one has failed. D is done. Only now do we drop down to rule number two. Please look at the front of the queue. The front of the queue has E in it. Vertex E is removed from the queue and the current vertex is now E. At this point, go back to rule number one and check E for all adjacent unvisited vertex. BFS says, once E is current, we must visit all adjacent unvisited vertices of E. Pausing the breath first search. Vertex E does not have another adjacent vertex. We've been to C. We've been to B. We do not take cycles in a breath first search. E is done. Only now we can drop down to rule number two. Please once again look at the front of the queue. Current vertex F is removed from the queue. The current vertex is now F. At this point, go back to rule number one and check F for all adjacent unvisited vertex. BFS says once F is current, we must visit all adjacent unvisited vertices of F. Pause the breath first search. Vertex F does not have another adjacent vertex. We've already been to D, we won't go back. Rule number one has now failed. F is done. Only now do we drop down to rule number two. Please look at the queue. Notice that it is empty. At this point, the queue is empty and the search is complete. Rule number two says he can't do new rule number one, remove a vertex from a queue. But when the queue is empty, the search is done. You can see that all the vertices have been visited, and this is the order in which the breadth first search, starting from A, visited the vertices. A to B to C to D to E to F. Everybody has marked visit on it. This search is done. There are some critical differences between breadth first search and depth first search. Let's look at those differences. A breadth first search uses a queue. A depth first search uses a stack. A breadth first search tries to stay close to the origin. A breadth first search starts at A and visits everybody that's close to A. A depth first search moves far away. A depth first search starts at A and goes out as far as it can before it comes back to A and goes out as far as it can again. The breadth first search is like a spider web. The depth first search is like a bungee jump. In a breadth first search, you do not leave the current node. When you start in A, you stay in A and visit everybody that's near A. A depth first search leaves the current node. A depth first search starts in A and then leaves A to go to B, then leaves B to go to E, then leaves E to go to C. It's constantly leaving the node that it just visited. Finally, a depth first search supports a minimum spanning tree. The result of a depth first search is something called a minimum spanning tree. That is a byproduct of a depth first search. Ginsa.com.